All right, merhaba. So this is a great pleasure to be here. Um, it's truly interesting to see, it's çok güzel, so to speak, to see all of you here talking about the future. Thanks very much for the invitation to Ufuk Tarhan. Uh, the name is the story, right, the horizon. Uh, thanks very much to the university for hosting this event. Uh, it's really a great, great pleasure to be here. Uh, I've been to Turkey many times in the past. The first time when I was 19, I spent six weeks in Çeşme, which, <laughs> which that was a long time ago. You know, I'm obviously a little bit older now. But um, it's always a great pleasure to be here and to see what's happening in Turkey. So, first of all, I want to uh, encourage you. I think in the going forward from today, every day that you spend at work or whatever else you're doing, 5% of that day should be a future day. 5% of your time should be spent about thinking about the future. You know, one of my clients is Google, and they have a rule that 10% of your time has to be spent on new projects. And if you don't spend 10% of your time on things that have nothing to do with your work, you get fired. Right? Many of the companies that I work with, you spend 5% of your time on things that are not for work, you get fired. So this is something to think about. Spend some time in the, every day talking, thinking about the future and what's coming up. You know, in my work, we have a motto. My company is called the Futures Agency. We're in Switzerland. We have a very simple motto, and it's, it wasn't raining when Noah built the ark. And this is so true for so many of our clients, is that they're currently doing well. They're not doing bad. But five years into the future, it's very likely that half of their business will come from things that don't even exist today. So, I have two kids, you probably have kids, some of you. And when I look at my kids, I can safely say that my younger son is probably going to have a job that is not even invented yet. And when you think about this, you have to think about the future in a different way. You have to think about it in a way like, you know, this drawing that I use, this, this illustration. Now, bring it down a very complex environment to a simple point. That's kind of what I do in my foresights. Also, I have a method of doing this by, as the movie, Back from the Future says, I try to go into the future and come back, you know, five years into the future, and then decide what that means for you today. For example, when I worked for the music business, I used to be a musician and producer. When I worked in the music business, in digital music, I talked to the music companies about the internet, and I said, basically, you cannot keep people from downloading without paying. Because, you know, that's the internet. That's what computers do. They make copies. So you have to look into the future and think about how you make money with a new model, with a new system, a new logic. Because technology is interrupting us. Right? It's disrupting our environment. I mean, think about this. If you're a hotel, TripAdvisor can put the fear of God into you. Right? what people write about you on TripAdvisor and reviews. I mean, this is empowerment of the users. So it's very important to look at the future and say, what's going to happen in five years? And then come back to today and not go from today into the future, right? because it's always going to be the same thing you're already doing. There's a very important Chinese saying that says, if you want to know about the future, ask your children. And why is that so true? It's because children don't have to go and think about how to fulfill a role and to be an executive or how to monetize, you know, make money. They don't think about this, they play. Right? So we need to spend more time playing. Because if we don't do this, we don't discover what the future is. This is a very important point before I get going. I'm getting excited, so I'm taking my jacket off. I hope you don't mind. I'll stop there. Right? But basically, the, uh, the most important point I want to make as part of my conversation is that we're today living in a world to where machines and technology is creating a handshake for us every single day. It's getting deeper every minute. If you have seen the movie Her, the Spike Jones movie, you fall in love with the operating system, that is not far-fetched. I mean, many kids are in love with their mobile devices. It's just one step further. So every day we have this overlap of what machines do and what we do. And the future has a tremendous potential there, if we're looking at this overlap. It's our num one, number one opportunity and our challenge. Because one thing we don't want is that we have to become more like a machine so we can live in a world of machines. 
And, and there is a significant danger for that, obviously, which I'll show you shortly. But if you're looking at things like environment, there are estimations saying that if we use connected technology, sensor networks, connected traffic lights, connected energy to the grid, we can save 40% of the entire environmental costs by using smart technology, as, as uh, the uh, gentleman from BSH was saying. Right? I mean, clearly, this is tremendous possibility. At the same time, you know, doctors are now having access to a giant database of cancer cases when they're at the bad side of the patient. Think about the changes that makes for their role. As students can learn things online, anything, and you can learn anything online, you don't have a degree, but you'll get a job in an internet company because they prefer you over people with a degree, at least for now. And then we have digital money. I mean, imagine what this is going to do to the banks, insurance companies. I mean, Bitcoin, but I don't know if it's going to be Bitcoin or not, probably not. Right? But digital money is a certainty. In 10 years, we will not be carrying cash, except if we're worried about privacy. So there's a huge amount of opportunities here. And just as an example, you know what's happening today because all of our data is going onto the internet. Everything we do, everywhere we are, everywhere we move, everything we share, everything we like. There's a saying in America says, Google knows you better than your husband or wife. Huh? And it's true. Think about this for a second. Right? Because Google, if you use Google for seven years and you've been logged in, you know, like a good citizen of Google, right? then they know everything. You know, all your, your fungus nails and whatever your problems you have, right? So now we're looking at this digital universe and we're looking at a global shift from physical to digital. We're looking at this global shift because now all of a sudden everything that we're looking at is digitized. So, as an example, security, 50% of all military and defense budget in the future will be uh, based on, on digital problems, yeah? digital wars, digital security. So that's going to change our entire economy, how we do this. Now you can already hack into medical devices. Right? You have a pacemaker, somebody can find a way to get inside of your machine. Right? You have a self-driving car, like Google. Imagine if somebody can break into that car. Once we have 20 million of these cars, they can break into your car and lock you in there for the rest of the year. Right? Or drive you against a tree. So a lot of things will change because of our digital environment. And this is also because we have these revolutions in interfaces. I mean, when I started using computers, you have to type, and then you have to figure out how to use it. Right? Today, you know, I gave my mother an iPad. She's 77. For her, the iPad is the television. Right? She doesn't know there's a difference. She says, I'm watching television, but she's, she means the iPad, right? Because she can just touch it and it goes, right? So the future means we can speak to our computers. We won't be typing in a few years, except for certain purposes. We'll just speak. We'll gesture. We have holograms. We have headsets. It is already possible for a person that's completely paralyzed, a quadriplegic, to walk again using brainwave computing interfaces with a skeleton, an external skeleton. It takes three years and a million euros, but it's possible. So a lot of these things sound like science fiction. You know, when you look at a technology and you're saying, okay, these people are using devices to do all these things, right? they sound like science fiction. But think about this for a second. If you're watching a science fiction movie like Blade Runner, you know, this means I'm very old because Blade Runner is old. Minority Report, uh, Oblivion. Of course, AI and her. Many of the scenes from these movies are reality today. I mean, it's mind-boggling to see how quickly that changed. A lot of these things will be just an, as real as SMS in 10 years. That's a scary thought when you're not 15. So back to the movies, you know, years ago, Star Trek had a device called the tricorder. This was in the, in the 70s, I think, right? This device will analyze your blood and everything and actually give an opinion what's wrong with you and also fix you in the process. Eh? Well, now the tricorder challenge, part of the X Prize, is giving this guy, uh, Corey Andraka, is giving this guy $23 million to invent the tricorder. And the tricorder pokes your finger with blood, you can cough into it, you can touch it, you can measure your pulse, 
and it gives you in 14 minutes a better diagnosis in a team of 10 doctors, allegedly. Right? Now, if you're a doctor, you wouldn't necessarily be so happy about this comparison. And I'm not so sure it actually works, right? But imagine what this does if it, if it hits the market in a few years. Every old person that cannot easily go to the hospital, you can send your grandmother this device for 200 euros, and you can always make sure she's okay. And that's tremendous, but at the same time, maybe it's not a, it's not a human, right? It's a machine. It doesn't do the same thing. So it has good side effects and, and also bad side effects, but we're experiencing an age of exponential computing power. You know, I'm not a technologist. I, I studied comparative religion, theology, Greek, Hebrew, and music, you know, so I'm not, I'm not a tech guy. But I can tell you that technology is absolutely exploding in computing power. The power that we have in our mobile phone today is more the than the entire array, all of the rate arrays of NASA and, and uh, the Pentagon put together just 15 years ago. Mind-boggling. So when you're looking at all the things that happen, like gene, genomic analysis, right? people growing older, we are actually, all of us, are gaining eight hours of lifespan every single day in the West. We're getting eight hours older just because of advances of technology. Many of our children will live to be 100 as a standard, right? Can you imagine this? What that will do to everything, our social system, everything, social media. So, for example, what's happening with medicine, you know, $7.2 trillion pharma business could be wiped out by the fact that we're going to be able to fix diseases before they occur. A personalized medicine. How far away is that? 10, 15, 20 years? So we're looking at fundamental changes in how we do things. And uh, as Chem was saying earlier in his speech, uh, the shift from ego to eco, I'll talk more about that as well. So now we have uh, last week in Barcelona, or this week in Barcelona is the mobile summit. This device is a, is a mobile phone by Firefox, the browser company. It will cost $25, $25 smartphone. In India, we have a tablet called Aakash selling for $28. A tablet, right? Sold already 35 million copies. Every person in the world, every person, literally every person, that is connected, we're talking about 5 billion people in less than five years, will be traveling with a smart device. Think about a second what that means for business, for politics, for understanding stuff, for education, for payments, for all of us. 80% of that traffic being mobile. I mean, you guys are WhatsApp users, right? I mean, I don't have to ask. Everybody is a WhatsApp user, right? If you don't know what that is, then you're maybe you're not a user. But WhatsApp allows you to, make, to send free messages over the, over the internet, right? Over data. 480 million users. Facebook purchased WhatsApp for more than the purchase price than Sony Corporation. Right? No revenues, almost no revenues WhatsApp has, right? For 43... Uh, $43 per user. So you know what's going to happen next with this disruption. If you're in the telecom business, you're not happy. Anybody here in the telecom business? You know what happens here is that you don't use SMS anymore. You know how much money the telecom is making with SMS every single day? Take a wild guess. $300 million a day. Every single day. And that money is leaving. Uh, because this people can do this now. So now we have things like automatic translation, also launched at the Mobile Summit this week, where you can call somebody and actually have a conversation with people in 24 languages in real time. I can call somebody in Chinese and speak in German that comes out in Chinese in real time. I mean, this is a future that probably makes you think if you're a parent, you know, if your kids are ever going to learn languages. Why would you do that? I mean. It's different, but definitely a question. So I can safely summarize for you, as, you know, if you hadn't known yet, business as usual is dead or dying. Okay? If you work in a company where you can do business as usual, congratulations, continue. Right? But that will be the exception. First, the music companies, the movie companies, the publishers, the telecoms, the banks, the mining companies, the transportation companies, the power companies, and so on. It just goes on in this succession because of technology. 
So what we have to do now in the future, or today, starting today, is to reinvent what we do and how we do this in an entirely different way. And I think that's going to be done in such a way where we are in this uh, devil's cycle of doing business in the same old way, where we have to find a way out of this. Because, yes, I would, I would grant you, in many ways, it's, it's still working just fine. But you can, you can agree that pretty much in the future, 98% of our businesses will not work fine in the same way they did today, because the consumer is changing and the world is changing, and, and at a very fast pace. So a few days ago, I got into a Twitter fight with Turkish Airlines. Uh, I'm sure there's lots of reasons to tweet about Turkish Airlines, but I will not get into this. However, it has been a hobby of mine to discuss things on Twitter, just because I want to see how people react. Huh? So Turkish Airlines has t taken my tweet, and, and I've received several phone calls and emails about this topic. This would have been impossible, think about that, five years ago, to get anybody to pay attention to it. They would just say, you know, so what, you know, go away. Right? Now everything is in the public. You can't possibly avoid this. You want to grow, then they're, they're going to take up this concept and do something with it. And same goes for, for what has been referred to as Lyconomics. There's a great book written by a friend of mine, Rohit Bhagava, called Lyconomics. You should read it, because it's talking about how important it is for your customers to, be li to like you. To like you even if you don't fix the problem. This is the interesting part. Dell has 47 people working on Twitter to take complaints about Dell, and less than 1% of those complaints are being fixed. But 95% of the customers think that because Dell does this, it's a great achievement. You know, it's a public discussion about how bad they are. So that's economics is crucial. And now we're entering into a world of finding information. You know that Google is in the middle of transforming themselves into an artificial intelligence company. It's no longer about searching the web. It's about searching us. Google is searching us. We are the content of Google and of Facebook. Right? Because we create the metadata, you know, all the stuff that really matters. So what Google is doing now is to say, OK, in the future, how will we search? We're not going to actually type stuff in. We're going to hold our mobile device over the food and find out what's in it. That's hard to do, but people are working on that. We're going to find augmented information. We're going to look at books like this. Search becomes seeing, feeling, hearing, touching, and thinking. This is only a few years away. So think about what that does for just about everything, you know, that sort of giant you know, brain in the sky. In fact, Google calls this the global brain. They have a global brain project. <laughs> it's pretty amazing when you're thinking about the logo of this event you know, being a brain. And then we have the Internet of Things. Many of you may not know what this is, but the Internet of Things is essentially the concept that whatever we are doing as humans is now happening between machines. Here you see the connected traffic light. This light was $45,000 four years ago. It's 3750 now. And this traffic light and street light connects you and filters, uh, figures out who you are when you're walking by. It provides internet access. It measures the air quality. It sees how many people are walking by at what time so it can regulate traffic. It does all of these things that makes it smart. I mean, apart from the fact that this is an extremely powerful technology, again, we could save 40% of energy costs if everything was connected. And Cisco says we're going to have 75 billion things connected. You know, our wristwatches, our glasses, our suits, our traffic lights, our sensor networks, everything. Apart from that, it's also a scary thing. So what happens to our personal data? What happens to our privacy if the trash can knows that I've walked by? Right. Big question. Now you have dogs with tags. You know, you lose your dog, you can find him, right? And now you have babies with tags. I don't know how you'd lose a baby, but some people manage. But the thought of this, now you even have diapers that Twitter when they are wet, right? Can you imagine? It's called Tweet Pee. If you want to see something funny, take a look. Right? 75 billion connected devices. So everything connected, everything intelligent, real time, everything. Now I can tell you this is a nightmare or a nirvana. I don't know which one. It's obviously both. 
I mean, if you're a tech company or a mobile company or a marketer, you would say, oh, this is fantastic. I can make lots of money with this. <laughs> but there's many side effects that we have to think about and want to flag some of those. So it's a question of balance. Now, technology is a funny thing because technology does not allow us to say, you know, we're either off the grid or on the grid, like the matrix, you know, red pill, blue pill. That's not possible because the reality is if you're engaging in business or in anything, you cannot be off the internet, right? You can't be off the grid, it's not possible. You can move to the mountains of Switzerland, where I live, and, and, you know, and take care of cows, or you can move to the Amish country in America, yeah, and maybe then you can be off the grid. Right? So it's really a question of balance. We cannot afford to use technology that does harm to us, right? because it's becoming part just like air or water. The internet has become like air. Right? So. Bottom line is, I think, for some of these issues in the digital world, which is without, a, without a, any doubt coming upon us at mind-boggling fast speed. And the internet is becoming a place to where all these things are becoming completely obvious. We have to be connected, we have to be human-centric, we have to be sustainable, I'll talk more about that in a second, and interdependent. Right? If you ask companies 20 years ago, about what their, what their primary strategy was, was to say, we want to be independent so we can rule in our area, like Microsoft did. We can make lots of money and keep it for ourselves. Today, if you ask companies what do they want to do, they say, we want to be an important player in the ecosystem. We want to be indispensable. But they know that they cannot actually own the ecosystem. The only company that owns their ecosystem is Apple. That's very an interesting side effect. Uh, you cannot be completely independent in a world that's completely dependent. And that goes for energy, that goes for everything that we're thinking about. Huh? And then there's these things, you know, the internet is enabling all of us to become intelligent and devices to become more resilient, learning things. You know? And it's forcing us to be open and exponential. Now, there's nothing you can do about this. You can either say, okay, I, I throw this all away and I don't, I don't become part of it, or you just do what happens. This is something that we see in general terms, you know, as, my, as Chem was saying earlier, everything is moving on this trend from ego to eco, you know, from, to the connected world. Everything. Because in a connected world, we can solve very large problems. We can solve hunger, terrorism, energy, food. But in a connected world, you can't live in a connected world and say, you know, whatever happens here, I get 95% of it. Right? That, that will clearly not work. And that was the oil companies, for example, or the record labels who did this. Right? But that is ending. So this is really a very, very big shift that we're seeing. So back to the, to the key theme here, human-machine futures. How much of us is already connecting to machines? How much are we outsourcing our brains? Like, now, if you sit at the bar with a bunch of guys, 10 years ago, we sit around, we talk about football or women or whatever, right? Whatever. Right? You know what we do today at the bar? We're looking at what kind of apps we have on the mobile phone. Right? It's sad, isn't it? Right? Because it, technology has taken over to such a point where it's so important to have this. Right? So what is going to happen here? I think you know, if you're looking at products like Google Now, that allows you to have Google anticipate your next move. If you want to try Google now, you can try it on, on any phone. It's part of the Google app. But you should give it a try, because it reads all your information, and it tells you what's happening next for you. So when you're landing in Istanbul, it says, there's a traffic jam. You should call Jem and tell him you're half an hour late. Do you want me to leave a message? It, it runs the life for you. It runs your life. And of course, that's what technology companies want. That's what Amazon, eBay, and Yahoo, and Google, they want to run this for us. They want us to be the OS. Right? They want us to feed this OS. They want us to outsource the brain. And in many ways, it's convenient. Right? So I'm outsourcing my brain to the Kindle, you know, or e-book reader. So now I have 250 books on my Kindle. I can't take them with me on the airplane. It's better for me. But what happens if it doesn't work? I have nothing to read. So there's a dependency that happens here. And what happens with this, you know, you heard, you heard about this term called big data. It's very fashionable this year. It's 
more fashionable than social media, which is another paragon there. But what's happening with data is that we're now thinking about, look at this curve, you know, how much data are we generating? Every single person in this room, you're broadcasting where you are, what you like, where, where you've gone to, what kind of comments you're leaving, how you're connecting with people on Facebook, it's all there. And there's lots of good things about that, right? But what happens here is that data is becoming more powerful than oil. Now, I'm going to Dubai tonight to speak at a telephone, uh, telecom conference. Right? Tr tell that to people in the Middle East, right? that data is more important than oil. This is, of course, what they want to know about, how they're going to get beyond the oil. Right? So what happens is lots of studies saying, you know, we're looking at a future where the information business and the data business will make more than $10 trillion a year, which is more than all of the fossil fuel companies combined. Right? So data is truly the new oil. And that really changes our position. So here's an important question there. In this future, you know, the all-seeing eye, so to speak, because we're always connected, and we're always doing things there, right? What are we going to feel about this, right? Everything can be recorded, saved, and searched. Everything is being recorded. Right? I mean, just imagine the reality of a world that actually has Google Glass, which you may be familiar with, you know? that is a mobile phone sitting on top of your nose with a, with a, uh, a glasses-like setup. Everything recorded, every store you go to. So this is an important balancing act that we'll have to think about. Because this is the reality of the future that we're going into. The power of technology is exploding exponentially, it's becoming cheaper every single day, to the point to where technology is like air. It's probably better than air, because the air will be bad. Technology increases, and our privacy and anonymity completely goes away as a consequence. Right? This is not something we would want, because a world where we can't be anonymous is not no longer actually a human world, in my view. Right? This is very important to keep in mind, an important balancing act for the future. And then, of course, you know, I'm sure some of you feel the same way, offline is the new luxury. Not to connect, you say, oh, sh I can just be in the moment. Right? This is the new thing, it's a, it's a huge trend. Because guess what? It's not human to be constantly sucking at the end of a data pipe. Because, you know, our brain cannot take in all our information. We have to think about what that means for human applications. If you're in the tech business, you have to transcend technology. You have to use technology and then go beyond it. Right? Technology as its own purpose is useless to us as, as humans. It serves itself. It's a self-perpetuating machine. So, Buick has an initiative called In the Moment. A car company sponsoring an initiative to be in the moment. Suggestion to you, you know, every, every week for one day, or every two weeks, I do it every two weeks, you know, be in the moment, don't connect. Figure out what happens there. Do you have anything left to say to your children? Just kidding. Uh, so offline is a luxury that we should cultivate. Here's a short video clip that shows the current situation. Social media is great. It connects you to the world and the people you love. You can chat with your family or share a meal with friends and watch cute little cats do unbelievable things. Look, she sticks her head out of the box. But there are times when social media can get in the way of the real world. Remember that? It's the thing that happens when you run out of battery. That's why we've developed the Social Media Guard. It takes the social out of media and puts it back into your life. Let's see how it works. This which is a, it's a uh, fortunate accident that uh, Coke is actually a sponsor of this conference. <laughs> but there is a world outside of this, right? And uh, didn't get to actually read this, but uh, technology Social. technology has no ethics. This is important to remember. Right? Technology is about technology. And let's not confuse the issue. We can't fix social problems or political problems or whatever problems with technology. 
Technology does not provide that. Uh, by the way, I'll, I'm taking questions on Twitter. So uh, if you want to ask a question, just use the hashtag here, the, this hashtag, and ask me a question, but not in Turkish, please, but in English. And I will take questions through Twitter as well as in real life. You can actually talk to me as well. Uh, so Sophocles, my good friend, has a great quote that says, nothing vast enters the life of mortals without a curse. That's so true. Now, when we think about technology today, we feel very empowered. We feel, we feel very comfortable with it. But there's a curse. There's always a curse when there's a curse. It's like nuclear power. You know, no matter how you agree whether we should have nuclear power or not, that's a different topic, right? It does solve a problem, <laughs> but it has a gigantic curse. So what do we do? We can't just say no to everything that has a curse. We have to figure out a, a compromise, a balance, right? Take this, for example, face recognition. Face recognition is widely used around the world for all different applications. Right? And uh, here's a short clip on showing you how that works. Introducing Face First, the only turnkey biometric face recognition solution with revolutionary flexibility in acquisition, identification, and alerting. Live high definition video enables Face First to track and isolate the face of every person on every camera simultaneously. Facial characteristics become biometric templates. But the bottom line is this, right? This could be quite helpful for law enforcement and for criminals and so on. But imagine if you do this in a store, which stores want to do now. Eh? They want to be able to identify us when we walk into a store to figure out that I'm a dear customer right? and send an alert to everyone to come running to me. Right? Is that a good thing or bad? Is that a curse or is it a blessing? That's obviously both. But that doesn't mean we should outlaw technology, I guess. We have to have a balance for this. Right? So technology is really changing how we do things. This is one of, the, uh, one of my previous jobs. Yeah, I'm in the middle there. No, just kidding. It's how we use to build skyscrapers. Right? Now, in the future, we're going to have a combination of people building those skyscrapers. Right? We have little tiny robots coming along. That's already happening. So, you know, it used to take 400 people to build an iPad. Now it takes 33 people to build an iPad. But the future is it takes zero people to build the iPad. Because at, at a certain point, technology can do that. So there are studies saying that basically, depending on where you look, between 30 and 40% of all jobs could be done by automation in the next 25 years. For example, if you're a taxi driver, probably won't happen in Istanbul at some time, but if you're a taxi driver in Las Vegas, you know, we're going to have self-driving cars. Taxi drivers are not a good job. Translators? You're a translator? Hello, guys, up there? Uh, translator? Machines can probably do that pretty well, not entirely perfectly, but well enough to really cut into your activities. Or bookkeeping, take bookkeeping, right? 50 million bookkeepers were done away by software. A company called Zero in New Zealand. So what does that mean for us in the future? Where do we go? So what will it mean to be human in this world of technology? This is a key question. I think I have a bit of an answer, but I leave that to you to investigate as well. What does it mean to be human? And my thing that I want to suggest to you is that to, to be human doesn't mean we're going to beat computers. We're going to be better than machines. We have tried that. We have tried being better machines, you know, faster calculating, faster return, you know, faster machines. It doesn't work. We have to be better humans in the future, not beat the machines. I'll give you a short uh, clip here from Star Trek, which illuminates the point. It intrigues me, this Picard. In what manner, sir? Remarkably analytical and dispassionate for a human. I understand why my father chose to mind meld with him. There's an almost Vulcan quality to the man. Interesting. I had not considered that. And Captain Picard has been a role model in my quest to be more human. More human? Yes, Ambassador. Fascinating. You have an efficient intellect, superior physical skills, no emotional impediments. There are Vulcans who aspire all their lives to achieve what you've been given by design. Hmm. You are half human. Yes. Yet you have chosen a Vulcan way of life. I have. 
In effect, you have abandoned what I have sought all my life. So it's interesting, a scene from quite some time ago, right? No emotional impediments. It's, it is, in fact, those emotional impediments that are our future, because they're not copied by machines. It is, in fact, all of these things that we can do because we are human that will make us valuable in the future. Otherwise, you know, we can, uh, we can greet the robot revolution, because they can calculate quicker and be quicker. If you're looking at this graph, this is a very important graph from, uh, it's a simulation from Lake Michigan, how, how long does it take to fill up the lake? It shows exponentiality at work. So basically what we see here is that it takes forever to get going in evolution of things, you know, to grow quickly. But once it grows a little bit, as you can see here, in a very short time it goes boom because it's exponential, right? It grows exponentially. If you don't think that machines can be as smart as this, it's just a question of reaching the right takeoff point, the exponential point. And there is a uh, great saying by Ernest Hemingway, it says, how does a person go broke gradually, then suddenly? Okay. And this is so true for technology. When does technology take off? Well, it takes a long time, but when it takes off, you take cover. Right? And that's what we're seeing all around us. That's what we're seeing with printing organs, that's what we're seeing with, with all these things like nano, nanotechnology and neuroscience and all these things that we're looking at, right? they're gradual but then suddenly. And we have to think about what that means for us. I'll skip this one because I don't want to play too many videos for you, but simulating the human brain yeah. essentially looks like this, right? Trying to simulate the human brain. Today we're at this point to where if you ask the computer, if you, if you say to the computer, after the holidays, the scale becomes my enemy, you know, which means you ate too much in the holidays. It's, it does happen occasionally. Yeah? The computer will not know what to make out of this. No computer in the world will understand this statement today. How long will it take for that to change? Quite some time. It's about semantics, right? And understanding the stuff that's in between the lines. So one thing that's happening, I think, that's really quite interesting in, in many ways, is that we're approaching a world that is omniscience, you know, knowing everything. Because today in this world is not just Wikipedia, but you can tell, you know, already there's applications like Google Now and others that will go out and fetch information for you and deliver it to you in real time. And this is the future of information technology. Right? We don't search, we just have things delivered to us. So omniscience is within reach. Is it a good thing, right? Or a bad thing? Well, I would say it's pretty dangerous to be ignorant, but it can be just as dangerous to be omniscient. Yeah. Both things are probably true. So what do we do about this? What do we do about a world like this? This down here is a project called the Oculus Rift, which is a virtual reality gloss, glasses that you wear, to do virtually do things, anything from flying into space to solving complex problems to uh, operating on a patient to everything, right? to live in a parallel reality. Right? The bottom line is this, we're living in a world of exponentiality and the stuff that you see in her and other movies about artificial intelligence, you know, we're only right now at the, at the lowest point of that pivot curve. And there's many good things about this. For example, I'll be able to figure out, if I'm in the advertising business, I'll be able to figure out much more accurately how to reach people. And if I'm in the energy business, I'm much more efficient with distributing energy. There's many good things about artificial intelligence. So then we have to figure out what is this future? Are we going to end up in this space to where we're connected to this network? And how, how will that interface look like? And Google is already suggesting to us a world of augmented humanity. It's in, in fact, what Google is doing, it's outsourcing our brain to their servers. So I have my Google Plus, that's all my relationships on Google Plus, right? I, I have my documents, they're all on the server. I got my email, which they're running for me. I got my search history, and pretty soon I'm, you know, I, I'll, I get a tattoo, says Google. Or oh, well, owned by Google. It's one of my clients, so I can beat them a little bit. Augmented humanity is coming. Right? What do we do about this? I talked about the movie Her. I'll show you a short clip from this, but basically 
we are really starting to have relationships with our technologies. And we should think about what that means. How far do we take this? Good morning, Theodore. Good morning. You have a meeting in five minutes. You want to try getting out of bed? <laughs> Get up! You're too funny. I know you're living in my mind. Theodore, I saw in your emails that you'd gone through a breakup recently. You're kind of nosy. Am I? You'll get used to it. Chance to watch it, you should, you should do so. So what we're facing in the future is now what's called deep learning. And deep learning means is that computers can actually learn what happens in between the lines. They can understand the semantics. They can use massive computational power to translate stuff in real time and to do things that were previously considered human. And deep learning is what we're going to see in many parts of our society. We have to think about what that means for us in the future. I mean, if we look at automation, computerization, you know, the, the robot that makes you coffee. This is the first bar in the world where a robot will mix a drink for you. I don't think he'll make some very good margaritas, but maybe, yeah. And here's, here's, a, uh, here's a computer, um, a robot, that prints in your handwriting. I mean, this machine actually analyzes your handwriting and, and acts like it's you to write real-life letters. We're already at that point. So we're looking at the future. You know, there's many interesting angles about this. A total re redefinition of work and jobs. And I would submit to you that we're extremely lucky to be at this point. It is threatening to think about a job that you have that involves any sort of repetition. These jobs will be eliminated by machines to a large degree. But at the same time, think about how that frees us up for other things. Of course, not every cab driver can be a graphic designer, right? because, of course, they lack on the skills. So it has great impact on education. Uh, Kevin Kelly has come up with this graph saying that existing jobs will change and new jobs will come up. Right? And my colleague Thomas Fry says 60% of the best jobs in the next 10 years haven't even been invented yet. So what is our role? Is our role to hold on to the old jobs and fortify them against technology? I don't think so. Our role is to invent those new jobs. There are jobs that are going to happen. I mean, the jobs that don't even exist. Studies, again, you know, if you want to read the Oxford study, just download the PDF. They are saying that about half of our jobs in 20 years could go away with the technology revolution. What are you going to tell your kids what to do? How are they going to learn? Looking at this list here, 100% of, our, of chance of automation for telemarketers, for sewers, for mathematical technicians, for watch repairers, for cargo agents, for tax preparers, the list goes on. Consider yourself lucky if you are a plumber or an electrician, because <laughs> those jobs are not going anywhere. <laughs> so <laughs> that's a good job to have in the future. And this wave of data eh, that's becoming available, it means all the jobs based on data are becoming so much more powerful and easy to do. So that's definitely something we should look at. And then in Switzerland, where I live, we have an interesting proposal that maybe the Turkish government can consider, you know, eventually. Um, and that idea is to say, well, if we're going to have computers doing jobs, maybe we should just pay everyone to do something that is not, that is not usually paid for. Right? Basically, a guaranteed minimum income. In Switzerland, we have on the ballot this year a proposal that says we'll give 2,800 Swiss francs a month to every person in the country, whether they work or not. This is a crazy idea. I, don't know. I mean, we're only 7 million people. <laughs> it's not going to pass this year. But think about the logic. Wouldn't it be better to pay people to do what they want to do, which I call workupation, you know, a mix of work and occupation, than to become criminal as a consequence of unemployment? That's a question we're going to face in five to ten years. Because here we are at the university, clearly we need to ask this question, what is the impact of learning and education? Will we still need degrees? Well, clearly the question is not black or white or yes or no. Right? We need places, we need degrees, we need certification. But what happens now is that we're living in a world to where it's much more important to ask questions not to necessarily know the answers. Because that's the world that we are building our own world. 
where we need to rethink how we do things. And education needs to encompass this. I mean, clearly this is a, a large change for educational institutions to connect with that fact. And of course, as you know, you can already earn degrees online and basically in five years we're looking at the complete digitization of education. Textbooks, lessons, videos, certificates, virtual learning, vocational training. What a fantastic opportunity for any uh, traditional educational institution to transition. So I have one piece of advice for you, because I worked in the music business for a long time. Don't be a record label. Okay? When, you, when you do what the music companies have done, you end up with losing about 80% of what you had before. It's very important also that we consider we are, we are in fact going back to a much more human model of education, which is going to the right brain rather than the left brain. Well, traditionally speaking at least, the left brain is in charge of logic and understanding things, right, and calculating. This part of it, machines will do. Eventually, all of it, most of it. Right? So we're moving back to a, a, a design part, right? A, a place of recognizing patterns of imagination. And education will change a lot because of this. So when you look at the immediate future, we're already living in this world where everything that we do is in the cloud. So our music is up there. Our movies are up there with Netflix or uh, whatever channels we're using, or Hulu or whatever. And our books are up there. And our health records are in the cloud. Everything is moving into the cloud. That's why cloud computing is such a big deal. But ask yourself the simple question. Do we want to move into this cloud as, as, as a part of the cloud? Do we just want to be another device in the cloud? Well, yeah, the answer is, you know, we want to use that cloud because it, it's helpful. Right? But we don't want to become part of this cloud. That, there's a big difference here. Right? Evgeny Mozorov, who is a really smart writer and, and one of the biggest internet critics, he talks about what's happening in this world is that people are looking at technology as a giant solution for everything. So we have a problem, we use technology to fix it. The government can, cannot fix the roads, so we have a website where you can report the potholes. Right? We have all these things solving large problems, and we can essentially remote control everything. Right? And Google will solve death. This is a real cover from Time magazine. Right? Or the other thinking is we have environmental problems. We change how we run the world. We do geoengineering. We cannot control pollution. So then we go in and we engineer the weather. This approach is called solutionism. And I think this is a very dangerous thing. Right? Clearly what it means is that I would question this and say, is, is this really the way forward? That we invent a new technology to solve the old problem. Right? We really need to look in both directions, I think, there. And then we have data, the power of data. I mean, if you're not aware of this, you should think about this for a second, how important data becomes in an everyday environment. What people know about you when you buy groceries with a loyalty card, all the things that they have there. Mobile is the external brain, artificial intelligence is the connector. You've seen this scene from Minority Report, where he enters the store, and the store scans his eyeball, his retinas, right, and figures out who he is. But of course, he's got it from somebody else, so it's a tiny problem. But think about this. Huh? I mean, this is not far-fetched from our reality and things that we're going to see in the very near future. The CEO of IBM said something. I want to get your opinion on this. The CEO of IBM said, uh, big business decisions will be made not by experts or by t intuition, but by big data and predictive analysis. Okay. That's basically saying the fortune cookie, you know, you know what's going to happen, so that's what you do, and precognition, which is to anticipate things. I want to see a hand sign. Who believes this is true, that big decisions will be made by big data and predictive analysis? So let me see uh, hands here. It's okay. You can lift your hands. There's no punishment in the process. Yeah. Okay. All right. The other side of the equation is Albert Einstein, who said imagination is more important than knowledge. He also said not everything that can be counted counts, and not everything that counts can be counted. So which one of the two is it? I'm not going to ask for hand signs again because you're all going to lift your hands down, make me look stupid. But those two things are combining. We have to figure out a compromise between those two things. 
I think that statement from IBM is pretty dramatic when you think about, you know, that a machine could do that, right? Could do the analysis. Is that what we need in the future? And Ray Kurzweil, who's a futurist for Google, he says Google will soon know you better than your spouse. I think they already do. Right? So Google becomes this giant adjunct to what we do. And then there's a great book I read, I read recently by Dave Eggers called, uh, called The Circle. In the book, he says that the paradigm of a digital society is that all that happens must be known. And I would submit to you that is the end of the road if we go in this direction, right? It's good to know a lot of things, you know, ignorance can be dangerous, but omniscience is more dangerous. Right? Because what it does, it creates a giant machine, right? So we can expect in the near future a lot more of what I call data wars. On the left, we have our friend Obama saying, yes, we scan. Um, and on the right hand, we have the Merkel saying, you know, I've been scanned. And I, I did warn her about this, but she wasn't listening. But in the future, we can expect more discussion about what's happening with data. And this is crucial. We have to discuss how to keep data safe. Because otherwise, you know, we're going to become entirely digitally naked. This is a very big issue. So I'm going to talk about uh, one more thing, and then we'll do a wrap-up and take some questions. First of all, the concept now is, uh, of, of a digital world is that we feel empowered for everything. So it's, I call this omnipotence. You know? We feel like we can do anything. And this is a very powerful feeling for computers, or for, for, for people in a computing age, right? when we can actually change our genomes to solve problems, right? when we can do personalized medicine. Very promising, but also quite dangerous, as was said before, if taken together with what I call omnipresence, you know, to be present anywhere. I'm trying to figure this out because I have to travel a lot, so it's a good topic for me. But telepresence, holographics, Virtual travel, omnipresence is within reach, you know, being at different places at the same time. We're going to see a lot of this. And this is an interesting angle on this. This is an advertisement by Microsoft. I think it never actually went public, but I got it somewhere, where they're saying that, you know, you can actually get work done while you're having the happy hour appetizer or while you're hiking in the national park. The consequence of social media and mobile is that 20% of people who are working, they're spending, I mean, 20% of time is spent working more than before because of social media. We're actually working more because of technology. So the question is, this is a good question for all of us to ask when we go home, and is technology captivating, you know, exciting, or is it capturing you? Ask yourself that question. Captivating is one thing, but captive is another thing. And that's something we really have to be watch out in the future. Not time to play this video, but uh, this is a video by Apple called Misunderstood. You can watch it on YouTube. The question behind this video that shows a young guy making a movie, uh, don't turn on the music, just leave it like this. Uh, it shows a young kid making a movie at Christmas, but he's not participating in the family activities because he's making the movie. You should watch it on YouTube called Misunderstood. The question of technology is no longer whether it can be done, and this is very scary, but whether it should be done. So just five years ago, we were saying, now, if we can keep the world's information and all the information about us on a server, we can do all these miraculous things. And now we can do that. Everything is being kept. The question is not whether it, we can do it, but whether it should be done. And who controls it? And what kind of rules do we have? What kind of ethics do we have? So I'll give you a quick summary, and then I, I do hope to get your, uh, your tweets here. I've been monitoring it. It's mostly in Turkish, which I can't help with, but I will take another look at this. So, All right, so quick summary going back to what I said in the beginning. Right? We're moving into a future that's about being connected, but at the same time not being technology-centric, but being human-centric. You should gauge every company, every politician, everybody... You should gauge them not on whether they're furthering to be connected, but also if they're going to make it human. Right? Because in the end, that's what counts for us. Everything is going to be about being sustainable. I always say when I work with Unilever, which I do occasionally, that uh, sustainability, sustainable is the new profitable. 
It's the new de definition of making money is to be renewable. And all of these things that are quite scary, you know, when the system becomes intelligent, when it becomes exponential, when it becomes abundant, you know, plenty, when it becomes open, right, brings up the risk. I mean, think about this for a second. If you live in a controlled environment, you know, you don't allow much change, it feels safe because nothing is coming in from the outside, right? As soon as you start connecting with others and you're looking at an open technology, for example, it's less safe right? because, you know, open technologies change. And this is why we have this challenge of saying we're living in a connected world, but the risk increases, right? It's a world that that is basically what we have. There is no other world. It, just in case you're wondering, there is no more disconnected world. You can have it in some places in the Swiss Alps or wherever, right? but we are now living in a digital society, and that's it. And there is no going back on that basic, simple fact. The other thing is that we have to be careful of, because you know, when we're looking at technology, we always get really excited about possibilities. But let's not confuse the realities. You know, when we have cool technology and all this data and we can be smart and we can you know, use machines to support us, we shouldn't think of ourselves or of our customers or anybody else as machines, right? because we're not. Right? We should not fall prey to machine thinking. That everything can be calculated, everything can be measured, everything can be mapped. Right? Machine thinking is a huge issue. The other one, this, this little clip from uh, a movie that I uh, quite like, it's called Connected by Tiffany Schlein. It illustrates the point, we're no longer living in a world where everybody has their own tree. You know, where companies are living in their own domain, where people can run things by themselves, where we can have four oil companies controlling the flow of money around the world and the economy as a consequence. We're no longer living in that world. We're living in a world that's completely interconnected. Telecom companies must talk to media companies, they must talk to advertisers, they must talk to internet platforms. And we're basically connecting business, technology, ethics, culture, and politics in this way. And there's no way around it. That's also a solution for a lot of large topics, of course, is to create new ecosystems. So I, I mentioned this briefly, but what we're, we're heading now into a world, uh, and we've had this discussion for a long time, I call this sustainable capitalism. It's not invented by me, but you know, as you, I'm sure you're aware of, there really isn't much of an alternative to capitalism uh, in itself. Everything else has been tried. But the kind of capitalism that we have must reinvent itself to be renewable, right? to be sustainable, because otherwise we're reaching a ceiling and explode. In terms of uh, climate change, in terms of resources, in terms of everything. So that has been referred to as a circular economy. Right? Basically taking and giving in the same process. And this is really what we're discussing on a global level now. And this is what technology affords us. Right? Technology actually gives us those tools to create a circular economy. Right? And some people have referred to that as the triple bottom line. I think if you read Jeremy Rifkin, you'll find out more about this. Right? The triple bottom line is about people, planet, and profit. Those three together, right? to make those decisions together. So I think that's our future as humans going in this direction. And uh, Patagonia and others have already found this out, that emotional impact on customers will be in direct proportion of the social purpose. So ask yourself this, you know, when you're going back to your office, does my company have a purpose? Do we have a message? If you don't have a purpose, you're not fit for the future, right? because people are looking for a purpose. They're not looking for you to just make money but to make money with a purpose. And this is a crucial thing, I think, that we're seeing around us in ecology everywhere. So anyway, um, I will publish this PDF because, you know, it's been quite a few slides and you've been very brave uh, sticking your head out on this. I will put it up on my website tonight, futuristgerd.com. Uh, it's uh, not hard to remember, but otherwise just search for Gerd. And also on Twitter, at gleonhard, I will put up the PDF so you can download it later. And we will have a video. So we do actually have some time for questions. And uh, while you're warming up to ask questions in real life, I'm going to look at the machine. And uh, I have a new app that actually answers the question also. It's called the Futurist app. Yeah. No, just kidding. It's not real. 
Okay, do, do we have a question here? Anybody in real life? Yeah? Okay, uh, don't, don't be shy. Okay, there's one right there. Should I get the headphone? Okay. All right. Go ahead. Oops, sorry. Okay, here we are. Go ahead. Uh, what is the difference about artificial intelligence and machine learning? <laughs> <laughs> you made me put this on. Now you have to speak Turkish. Uh, okay. And then, never mind. What is the difference? Okay. What? Huh? Where are you? <laughs> okay. Uh, what's the difference, difference about machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence? The difference between artificial intelligence and? Machine learning. Oh, machine learning. Okay, yeah, okay. Um, well, I'll make it quick, you know, I'm not an expert on artificial intelligence, uh, obviously. But basically what artificial intelligence does is that it tries to simulate what we would do as humans. So there's a learning process involved. For example, the Google self-driving car is a great example. If you're in the Google car, it's driving itself. If you go down the road and there's a frog sitting on the road, okay, and there's a double yellow line, the Google self-driving car will not do anything because it can't kill the frog, it can't go over it, it can't cross the line, it doesn't know what to do. It doesn't know that you can break the rules. And it will sit there for the next two years until something happens. So artificial intelligence would say, you know, I've seen this before and it's just a frog. You know, I can go around it. It would make a decision of some sort. And so this is what we have now with artificial intelligence, you know, very simple things like recommendations and others is that it can act a little bit more human. But that's a, f a long way away of uh, sentience, you know, actually understanding life, you know, that, that's really quite different. Uh, as compared to deep learning and those kind of things, of course they go together. Uh, in deep learning, really, the idea is to say that the computer can make their own decisions right, within reason to figure out to be more proactive. Any other questions or comments? Turkish or not? Okay, question right here. Uh, what would be the major competencies of the future business managers or leaders? Very good, yeah. <laughs> major competencies. I, I think b given that we're giving up a lot of competencies that are now done by machines in the near future, our competencies are things like negotiation, discussion, discovery, imagination. All the stuff that we didn't want before. <laughs> you don't want somebody imagining things, you want them to just get stuff done. Right? But now the future is, is the reverse of this, right? There's a design process, there's a negotiation, there's understanding machines, right? there's understanding a wide context, and of course, global thinking. Right? So I, I would maintain, you know, most companies I work for, in the future, we all have to be a little bit of a futurist to be able to move quicker. Because the other thing is that's really important is speed. We have to become quicker at understanding and changing. And if you see all the really big startups that are happening around us in technology and stuff, they're all people who start from zero to whatever in 18 months. And most companies take 18 months to have a board meeting and discuss something. So we have to be able to move faster, be more proactive. Now the other thing I think that's important to understand is, as, uh, in business is that most of the uh, developments and the, and the funding and the reality is moving to the emerging countries. It's moving away from the mainstream of business. US, Europe, right? And Turkey has a very interesting position there, I think, you know, being there and here in connection. That could be a very, very powerful position to be in, clearly. Right? So, not, it's not an emerging country, obviously, but being in the middle between all those things could be extremely powerful. So I think we have to understand that innovation and growth is all moving to the guys that didn't have anything. Right? So the South and the East. And that will create fantastic opportunities. Uh, one more point on what executives have to understand. You know, I'm 53, but it's, it's very hard to understand all the stuff that happens with technology. But sometimes it's a very good exercise to pretend that you're 15. To pretend to go inside of these things that only kids do. Because if you do, then you realize the changes that are happening while they're happening. Right? You can't actually learn how to swim without getting wet. Right? 
If you don't understand how this actually works, you'll never make the right decision. Right? It's very important to be able to simulate and understand technology. You know, I'm always fighting this uh, discussion between technology and humanity. I think in the next 10 years, we're going to come to a point to where we can find a good balance between those two. Using technology, and becoming more human as a consequence. Huh? And that will be a very, very large debate about how that will actually happen. Okay. Do we have other questions? Hello. Uh, a few years ago, I was watching one of these angel investors program on television. And uh, some uh, business uh, startup owner uh, had invented some kind of technological teddy bear which was able to tell fairy tales to children before night sleep. Okay. And um, one of these angel investors had told that, wow, that's a good idea, but it's not the job of uh, technological teddy bears to tell fairy tales. It's father's job or parents' job. Yes. And uh, what do you think is the missing link uh, between this technology and the future of humanity? What do you think, which kind of uh, startups will fail in the future in, the, in, in terms yeah. of technology? Uh, very good point, yeah. I, I think there's a lot of technology that is trying to essentially replace what we do as humans by using something that we can buy. You know, for example, in the segment of fitness and personal medical care, there's like a hundred things you can buy to make you better and fitter, right? But what it does, it just transfers our responsibility into an app. Right? And the app happens to make money with it, which is a good thing. But it's short-lived. Right? Really good technology changes us as people in what we do and how we do it and empowers us. Right? It doesn't allow us to transfer our jobs into other things. You know, for example, there's a fork that was uh, called Happy Fork. You may have seen it. Uh, the Happy Fork is an invention by a French guy that you use the fork to eat, and if you eat too quickly, it, it vibrates, and, and it makes you eat slower and be more healthy, right? So when you think about this, you could have a thousand things like this, right? It's, uh, controlling your life and, and, and telling you what to do. At a certain point, you have to wonder what the actual purpose of it is, right? So you will not see a lot of technologies like this that will be successful in the long run, because, you know, they're, they're a gimmick, essentially. Right? So. The ultimate test for technology for me, I sometimes also invest in technology, is uh, to say that if technology transcends itself, right, if it uses itself but goes beyond you know, to transcend what it does, then it's of interest. Right? If it actually goes beyond technology and has a purpose, right, that's when I'm interested in. For example, I'm really interested in how technology can make the world more efficient energy-wise to help us reduce costs while we switch to renewable energy we can solve this problem. Right? We can solve the energy problem by those two things. But just being efficient will not do the job. Right? We also need to do other things. So, for example, you may know a, a site called Cloud, K-L-O-U-T, which measures how important you are. Right? So I go there every day. No, I'm just kidding. But, yeah. but <laughs> people like the site because, you know, you put in your Twitter name and your social media and it says, oh, you, you know, you're rated 72 or whatever, right? Right. Of course, yes, it's a game because you realize, you know, it's basically, you know, it's just a stupid algorithm, right? But now you have the first hotels in the world that are saying if you have a cloud score over 60, you get a free upgrade because you're important. Right. And of course, nobody knows what the algorithm is. So you can clearly see here that this is a game that is kind of an interesting game. But the reality is my cloud score is absolutely not realistic, just like how many times I've tweeted is no measurement whatsoever of my value. Right? It's not even a measurement how many people I have on Twitter that's a value. Right? Let's not confuse the 5% of data that we have with the actual reality. Because right? the reality is much more complex. That's like saying a computer can be my brain. A computer can do a tiny fraction of my brain. Right? Eventually that may be different, but... Yeah. So, we should not invest in businesses that will try to replace us by being imperfect and pretending to be real. You know, that usually doesn't work. So, other questions? Gerd, first of all, it was great listening to you. Uh, the information you gave is very exciting, but a bit worrying mm -hmm. on my side. That's what we need. Yeah. 
Uh, I want More to worries. ask you two questions on behalf of parents in this room. First of all, how will we guide our children? Like you said, most of the jobs for them are, do not exist right now. Uh, and two, how much time would you allow your children to spend with technology, like playing iPads, PlayStation, etc.? Yeah, well, those are complex questions. Yeah, but let's first talk about worry. And uh, you know, basically, I think that the way that things change is usually in, in a combination of uh, pain and love, right? So you're experiencing some pain, so therefore you decide I got to do something else, right? But you also, at the same time, you have to have an alternative. So this is why it's good to be worried. It's not a bad thing to be worried. If, if we don't worry, we're not going to do anything. But we also need new things to believe in. Right? So we need both to create both. Right? Uh, to your question as regards to kids, right? with my kids, I don't know if I was successful, but we'll, we'll turn out eventually. I'll show you some pictures. But, but um, what I try to, to show them is a discovery process of how, how they can discover their future. Because really that's all that matters is that you find a way that fits you in the discovery rather than finding something that's out there that you be fit into. Right? So the important part of education is that discovery process. And it's really about discovering what makes you special in the job that you're going to do. And create your own job. Right? I mean the other day I, I, I, uh, I found a guy, I met a guy who, whose business it is to keep me private on the internet. He invented this business. His, his business is exploding. He's got like 50 employees to keep people from being abused, you know, to keep them private on the internet in all different ways. Right? So this job didn't exist. Right? I would submit, submit to you that I think we're going to see in the next five years that uh, 25 to 30 percent of people will start their own companies as a result. So we need to teach them how to be independent, to be connected, to be open and to invent themselves, right? to be more entrepreneurial, because that's very likely going to happen. Right? So we keep talking until the evening or not? Just okay. I'm ready to have my köfte. Bu muhteşem sunum için çok teşekkürler. Benim sormak istediğim. Okay, sorry. İnsanlar. Sorry, I have to get the box here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sunumunuz için çok teşekkürler. Ee, sormak istediğim soru insanlar arası ilişkilerde en önemli başarı noktalarından biri de empatik olabilmek. Maalesef bilgisayarlar bu bağlamda otistiktirler. Ee, o halde biz gelecek için insana has bu özelliği yakalamamız mümkün değil. Kıyaslamamız hangi anlamda olabilir? Teşekkürler. <gülüyor> yeah, well, that's a very good question. I, I, the short answer would be for me, if you're talking to a lot of people in business, it's exactly the opposite that was required, which is not to be empathic, right? So, I mean, it's interesting to see that we're looking for empathy now, when until now to be a businessman meant not to have empathy, right? But to look for profit. So I, clearly, to me, the answer is our way forward is to be have emotional imperfections, right? To have empathy, because the computers don't do it. Even though I would submit that we'll probably learn a little bit of it, like in the movie Her, you know, to simulate us badly, of course. But, you know, our competency is those things, you know, those ephemeral things that we can connect to create values. I mean, this is where we're going with this. We are not going to beat the machines on all that other stuff. I mean, that's just, it's already over. So there we have to find a new position and that education is really in demand for this. How do you educate people to be creative? I mean empathy, how do you create empathy? And I think in the future a large, a larger money will be spent on teaching people to do that because that's how they create value. But I, I agree with you, it could very well be that computers will take a piece of that and in the future also take a piece of our jobs as a consequence. I don't really know how that will pan out, but that's probably a little bit further away. Again, I'm not comparing humans with machines at all. I'm just saying that it's something we have to keep an eye on, because what we have today is a world that's becoming more technologized by every second. 
in many different ways. And, and it's not, not all dangerous, but some of it is. Any other questions or comments? You decide. Thank you. I will start with a confession. Uh, I'm like your mother, despite uh, I'm younger than her, I assume. Okay. Uh, I hesitate to use the uh, full 360, the internet world and the digital world, just because of the safety reasons that you just mentioned. And you, thought, you all say that it's a risk to be considered. And I always have thought it like a door, and once you enter, you give your everything to the other part of the world. And so far, whatever I have shared through the internet, I thought it's okay for me to share with the rest of the world population. So how can we balance it? Just uh, still being part of this world, but and still protecting our uh, own, or, uh, own confidentiality? <laughs> that's a, well, that's a, I'll make a quick answer. I mean. My belief is, I understand your problem, I have very much the same problem. My belief is that to safeguard us uh, on the digital network, I mean, we're going to talk, this is five billion people who have this problem very soon, it's not just us. Right? It should not be the job of the individual to figure out how to encrypt their email or, you know, most people don't do that. Right? I mean, to keep us safe in those things is the job of government, is the job of the companies providing it, that service. Right? It's the job of Google and Facebook, and it's the job of the government to figure out how can we be safe and what the rules are. I mean, every new technology needs new rules, new norms, new markets. And so, ultimately, it shouldn't be the job of the consumer to figure out how they're going to, you know, I mean, you have to be responsible, but you can't be, you can't be responsible for the whole system, which means that you couldn't use it. So it's a difficult topic, clearly, there. Um, one thing that has been discussed, I think that would be helpful in this context, is to look at something called the Global Digital Rights Bill, which is about your rights as a citizen of the Internet that we're going to see more of. Right? Anyway, so I think we should continue talking outside because lunch is, lunch is ready, right? So you can tweet me or email me or, you know, find me out there somewhere. Thanks very much for your time. Thank you.